So, dear Rock Mechanics colleague, hello and welcome to everyone. Thank you very much for being here today in order to, att to attend the fifth Rock Mechanics European debate. My name is Muriel Gask and I'm the new elected Vice President ISLM for Europe. As you probably know, the first European debate was organized in 2021 under the supervision of Charlie Lee, Leandro Halejano and Philippe Bascou. So it's very nice to have uh, Charlie Lee today as a debater. Those debates aim at simulating communication among academic and practitioners of rock mechanics and rock engineering in Europe. So I won't give you all the title of the former debate, but I would like to remember all that all the debates can be seen on the ISRM YouTube channel. And the exact link of the YouTube channel is on the flyer of the today's debate. As it's my first debate as an organizer, I hope everything is going to work well and I won't be longer. And then I give the word to Philippe Vascu, who will introduce the today's topics. Thank you very much, Muriel. So uh, I'm Philippe Vascu, the, and I will be the, the moderator today. So we, as, as previously said, we're on the fifth debate. And these debates work well. I mean, we are trapped with these kinds of debate. A lot of people, practitioners, young engineers, uh, doctorates and postdoctoral engineers. That's very, very inter uh, interesting. I'm today very proud to have two real experts on the subject of rock bolting. They are different, but I'm going to introduce the first one, uh, Charlie Lee. Dr. Charlie Lee uh, has worked first as a mining engineer and is now a professor in uh, NTNU, the Norwegian University of Science and Technology located in uh, Trondheim, Norway. He's, he has spent a huge part of his life regarding rock bolting, rock bolts, support, and so on. He is in that field a real expert, and he is going to, to make his presentation focusing on mining aspects. Uh, Charlie, that's up to you. Thank you very much, uh, Philip. Uh, let me share my presentation. Um, you have to give me a right to share screen. I do not have the right now. Uh, Muriel? Muriel. Muriel. We have a problem with Muriel. Sorry, I, I just switched off my microphone. I, I think it's okay now. You should you should be able okay. to. Okay. Yes. Yes. Is it okay? Uh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. That's why now um, I share my screen. Yes, I switched off my. Mm hmm. I suppose you can read uh, my screen. Fine. Good. Uh, I just get to the point, and then that's good. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you, uh, everybody. Thank you, uh, Philip and Muriel. Um, so it's my pleasure to uh, to be asked to give this uh, presentation. Uh, I'm uh, looking forward uh, to uh, discuss this uh, the rock bolting issues with uh, my uh, my colleague uh, Robert and the others on the line. Uh, rock bolting. Yeah, um, well, that's a long time ago. I started to, you know, with this ground support, and I got, I was confused. And, you know, some people they talk about the rock bolting, it works. Some some say that it doesn't work, and then that was a long time ago. I started to think to, to think uh, about uh, the function of uh, rock bolts. In the past um, twenty five or thirty years, I worked a lot with that. Um, I just summarize what my uh, my thoughts about that, the observations and uh, thoughts. So I conf we are concentrated to uh, uh, rock bolting methodology in underground hard rock mines. Um, so let me see here. Um, um, how can I go go further? Yeah. 
Uh, first, uh, look at uh, a case. Uh, this is a uh, uh, rock heaven uh, uh, constructed in uh, in 1994. That's for the Olympic uh, uh, game in uh, in uh, Norway. Uh, this is uh, uh, the ice hockey uh, competitions was there. Uh, this cone was the largest one during that time. Uh, you can see the dimension is 61 meters wide, 95 meters long, and 25 meters uh, in height. Uh, so the rock cover uh, was uh, very, uh, yeah, varies from 25 to 55 meters. Uh, it is less than the span of the cavern. Uh, people uh, uh, measure load, the bolt load. Uh, of course, they use the bolt, uh, six meters uh, bolt, and then they measure the bolt. Uh, and then they got this, uh, this, uh, this load uh, in the bolt. So the bolt only carries very low load, uh, 10 to 15 kilonewton. Uh, that's very natural that people will, some people will, will say, that, well, look, so most of the people both do not work, do not carry any load, and the question is, that means you do not need the bolts. I don't, I don't think anybody can accept that uh, design without bolt to to uh, construct a such a cabin. Uh, so uh, that's uh, that was the question: Are the rock bolts necessary? The answer, I think, the common answer was yes, because that's not only single bolts carry load. The bolts help uh, the rock mass, you know, just hold the rock mass blocks together and uh, so that the weight force of the rock, uh, rock cover is transferred to the abutments of the, of the cavern. Without the bolts, some block will fall and the others will fall, right? It's an unraveling uh, failure. So that's the, uh, you know, real function of the bolts and not the bolt uh, do not carry all the load, instead help the rock mass. To, to stabilize itself. Rock bolts uh, are load uh, not evenly in the, in the reality. Here's a, a photo uh, show that how these the two bolts uh, failed in, in a blocky rock mass. So this, of, of course, the joints, the joints shear and opening, and then they, they fail. So uh, the load is not uniformly uh, along the bolt length. Uh, this photo just tell us. So, and then uh, we come to the to the things I want to present. So first, we have to understand the loading conditions on the ground uh, depends on the in situ stresses. Uh, if we look at this, we we divide the stress is state to a low stress and the high stress, and the consequences in the rock mass uh, are different. Uh, in a low stress situation. Uh, quite often we have a block fall, and then in that during that case the support load, you know, the load on the bolt or support element would would be a constant. That's the dead dead weight force of the falling block. Uh, now the requirement to the ground support, we need a very strong element uh, to stop this fall. If there's very high stress, and that depends on the in weak rock or hard rock. In weak rock, the consequence is squeezing. Uh, deformation, uh, and then we do not have constant support load. Depends on you know how much the deformation we allow the rock mass to develop. That's the ground response curve. Uh, tell us the relationship between the load and the deformation. So in that case, we do not have constant uh, support load. Uh, if that's a very hard rock, very high stress, and then the consequence. A consequence is a rock burst. In this case, we do not either support a load because this depends on the you know the the energy, the, the burst energy. Uh, if we have a very stiff support system and then the support load would be very high when the rock burst occurs. So in the late this the, the high stress situation, we need a support system uh, which can uh, dissipate energy not only load we have to take into account. So this is the loading conditions uh, um, on the ground and the consequences uh, in the different loading conditions. Uh, here's the th three photos show that. Uh, in the low institute stresses, uh, we have a rock fall. Uh, we got this kind of rock fall. 
uh, in the weak rock, high in situ stress, and then we have very large deformation, this squeezing uh, rock deformation. Um, and then in the very hard rock, we have with the, we have rock bursts. And then we come to, uh, uh, so I, I'm talking just only the principles. Uh, uh, so in underground, around any opening, we have a fracture zone around the opening zone, out of this fracture zone, and then we have a natural pressure arch. In that place, the rock is intact, but the stress has been elevated. So the real ground pressure will be carried by this natural, I call it the natural pressure arch. So our support, ground support, this uh, uh, task is to st stabilize the fractured zone. Uh, so that's my, that's my uh, concept for ground support. Uh, here, based on the fracture, uh, fracture zone size, we have different principles. The first one, is a fracture zone is zero. So no fracture zone. Uh, and then only, you know, some some of the blocks uh, lo becomes loosened, they will fall. In that case, our support is a sporadic uh, bolting. Uh, and this is static ground support. And the second one, we have um, a fracture zone, not very large. Uh, and in that case, we, we use these two layers, I call these two layers. One is a systematic uh, bolting uh, to the natural uh, pressure zone. And we, we can put also surface support uh, uh, element like a mesh or short grid. So the two layers of support is, uh, is good enough uh, in a support system. In this case, the bolt uh, length uh, depends on the depth of the flex zone. And we have some one meter must be in the intact rock. Uh, the spacing, uh, so that's uh, also determined by the uh, flex zone size and uh, the bolt strength. So the principle three, that's a bit moderately large uh, flex zone. Uh, it's, uh, uh, that means the depth of flex zone is beyond the bolt length. Uh, so the bolt can, not reach to the natural uh, pressure zone. In that case, we have to use a tightly spaced uh, bolts to construct the artificial pressure zone in the fracture zone. Uh, so, uh, and then we use these cables to stabilize this artificial pressure zone. Uh, and then we also put this, uh, this uh, surface support element. Uh, if necessary, we, we also could put this uh, external support. So we have, I divided these, these layers. First, the systematic, systematic bolting. Uh, second layer is a strong surface retaining devices. And the third, uh, third layer that's long cable bolts uh, anchor this artificial pressure uh, zone to the natural pressure uh, zone. Bolt length. Uh, your body that's two and three meters, that's in, in mines. Uh, I'm, I'm in this in mines. I, uh, so this is a typical mine and uh, pretty simple. Uh, spacing, uh, that's a spacing, the bolt spacing uh, should be less than half of the bolt length. And if that's the very large, vastly large flex zone, and even the cables cannot reach to the uh, flex, uh, to the natural uh, to the natural uh, uh, pressure arch, and then we only use these short bolts uh, construct this artificial um, uh, pressure arch and use a very strong external support to stabilize this uh, artificial pressure arch. So, and and then the, the fifth, that's for dynamic, that's for rock burst support. Uh, for this one, we all the bolts should be uh, yielding bolt, bolts, that's energy absorbent uh, bolts, uh, systematic uh, bolting. Uh, and then we put the second layer that's uh, strong, uh, strong uh, surface support. And the third layer that's uh, op uh, optional, that's cable bolts. So the most important is different from the static support that's the bolts. Both then must be energy uh, uh, absorbing. So all these principles are not 
the from there, that's based on the practice. I you know just look at the, all the support and then I cut just the cut uh, cut guys the, all this support into these five uh, groups. Uh, that was the principles. And then now, if you look at the typical rock bolts, um, the rock bolts and the loading conditions. Uh, here, it's uh, uh, a diagram show the the load uh, the bolt load uh, in the field. This this was measured in the in 1980s in a blocky rock mass. You can see all this. This is a full grouted uh, bolt without plate. Uh, you can see the bolt uh, like this one. This is loaded. Uh, in, in that place uh, because of one crack opening. Uh, there with the time, that's one year later, it becomes so much. Uh, here, so you have, there's a two places uh, on that bolt, uh, the, the crack opening and the load of the bolt and the, the other two, uh, we have such, uh, such kind of uh, loading. Uh, that's the full grouted bolt. It's like this one. This is a full grouted bolt. I have the, this model. Uh, if we have a crack open in the rock mass, and then it will load at that position, uh, and then we have the shear stress along on the bolt, and the, here the axial stress like this. This is the uh, before any debonding occurs between the bolt and the grout. Uh, with the frictional bolt, it will be in this way, uh, and then for the end anchor the bolt, it's it, it doesn't matter where. Uh, the crack is located, it will be uniformly loaded, load this bolt because this is the bolt is only two point anchored. So it's a uniform axial stress. Uh, for the yield bolt, dynamic bolt, it's very similar to this uh, uh, end uh, anchored bolt. Uh, that's only the load capacity is higher. Uh, it can deform uh, longer uh, than this one. So uh, with this one, uh, this part, is called anchor section. If we have a crack uh, opening, if this part, the, this bond length is too short, and this will be pulled out, right? This anchor length must be longer than the critical bond length. Um, we we did some tests recently. Uh, uh, we published this, this already. We look at if the, the bond length is very long, it would this bolt would not could not be pulled out. Right? Uh, here's the loading process. Uh, so in the uh, in the pre-peak load, uh, this one, this this one uh, here, this is the load. Uh, this is the stress shear stress distribution along the bolt. This simulated the crack opening, uh, and then we have a very small debounding, and then here's the elastic deformation. Uh, here's the as the yield load. So this debounding section almost. It's not changed. Uh, only past the, the maximum load and then the bonding length increase a little bit, and then it it is like that. And then the load will reach to the, the strength of the steel, it will fail. Uh, this is um, different from the theory published in the literature. Uh, the, in the literature, they say this the bonding will increase, and then it's just developed to that that direction. Uh, the bonding section becomes longer and longer. But this is the bond section actually is very short. If the bond length is very short, uh, this will be it's shorter than the critical bond length. It will be pulled out. So here's the the shear stress development in the before the pre before the maximum load, and then the the stress is almost uniform along the length. Charlie, okay. two more minutes, please. Okay, so. Uh, this you can read more uh, in my papers. Um, so that was one crack, but for the for the uniform deformed rock mass, the stress is different. This is the measurement in the in the field. Uh, here's the shear stress. We have the maximum load there. This is without plate, with plate, and the curve will become like this. This maximum load will occur a little bit short to the tunnel wall. Uh, so uh, here's the, my concluding uh, remarks. Uh, rock bolts play an important role in ground support system. In burst support, they are the major devices uh, dissipating the burst energy. 
And the second point is the support load is not a constant in squeezing and burst prone rock mass. It is associated to the size of the fracture zone or the burst energy. So we have some issues. Uh, we uh, so the first one is uh, the rock the rock balls used in uh, in uh, squeezing rock mass are not satisfactory. Uh, the second one is whether the released burst energy or the rock deformation should be used for dynamic support uh, ground support design is still a dis uh, disputing uh, question. Um, the third one is it is a lack of a commonly accepted principles for rock board design at uh, this moment. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that was my presentation. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you so much for this uh, very interesting presentation, um, especially regarding the types of rock balls and uh, how they do work. Uh, now, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Robert Geller, our second speaker today. Uh, Robert worked uh, as a practitioner for Joe Consul Consulting Engineers, and it is, is now a professor at Monat Universität in uh, Leoben, Austria. Uh, when I say Austria, uh, you immediately understand that we are shifting from hard rock to more softer conditions uh, due to the existence of the alpine uh, terrain uh, around. Uh, so we, we will have this presentation on soft rock conditions. Uh, I just want to add that uh, Robert is at the moment the president of the Australian Society of uh, Rock Mechanics. Uh, Robert, uh, you can start when you want. Uh, thanks, Philippe, for the nice introduction. Can you already see my screen? Yes. Okay, fine. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks for the uh, invitation to this uh, lecture. My topic, uh, as said, is sporting in soft rock conditions, and I would like to uh, give you some, uh, let's say, insights from the practical uh, use of boards. When, we, when we're looking back, uh, you might remember the tunneling was done without any boards, but nowadays, uh, of course, modern tunneling is using boards, then followed normally uh, by inner lining. So, um, Charlie already mentioned squeezing conditions, we often have that. And you see here a typical uh, figure or picture uh, from uh, an actual tunnel drive where we have boards uh, plus also yielding elements in these soft uh, ground conditions. Now, before we, we start to decide where to put boards, uh, we have to think on the failure modes which we are dealing with. And it started already in older days with Komarel, it went over Zerzagi. Uh, then we had these uh, pictures drawn in 3D. Where do we really figure out the problems uh, in a soft rock uh, tunnel? Then we had these collapses uh, with having these shear zones, shear failure directly over the um, over the tunnel and then extend it with a second uh, shear failure um, figure. Then we had, um, let's say, this uh, area of what Charlie was calling a uh, fractured zone. We call it here the so-called plastic zone because we are a little bit more, let's say, in, in soft ground uh, dealing with that. And we had these uh, collapses where we had these face uh, problems, uh, face problems together with some problems, then in a distance of uh, one to two diameters uh, from the tunnel face. So having these uh, pictures in mind, uh, these are the essential drivers for, uh, let's say, the design of our uh, boards, what we are using. The load, so to say, is not determined by the overboard, but from the masses loosening during the construction. And the construction and support measures must be tailored to the respective ground conditions. This is uh, how we go forward. And we learn from the past. Uh, you might remember this uh, collapse in Munich, uh, uh, what we call a chimney collapse uh, at that time, 1990. And then we had uh, yeah, a lot of uh, losses uh, here and there. And this is uh, an example from uh, Sao Paulo, Binaeros, uh, where uh, the support didn't, uh, as it seemed, work really well. 
Now let's start uh, from from the Fender Bajo. Let's say the CCM method. Uh, what we do, we put uh, the deformation on the one axis. Uh, we put the stress on the other. Uh, we put the time on the third. And what we see here typically is the uh, so-called ground reaction curve. Um, and with this, and here we we see already a loosening of the ground a bit uh, because we were not able to bring in say the support at the right point. Uh, then what we do is to bring in the support in a way so that we meet equilibrium at a minimum. So better would be to meet the equilibrium here. And uh, if we draw the deformations which go in hand with the tunnel works, then we see where we meet this point, uh, we get the equilibrium. I think this is clear for everybody. Uh, but I want to stress that out because we have some, some possibility uh, to bring in some end fixed bolts. So Charlie was already mentioning them. Then if we have such a kind of bolts, we would draw that in a way what we see here in these curves one, two, three. The three also include some uh, yielding elements. And this is a typical board which is end fixed. So has one uh, end here, has a constant stress along the board here. And uh, that, is, uh, that is how we do it. But truly spoken, in, in soft uh, ground tunnels, we hardly use this kind of board. Normally we use uh, a kind of board which we uh, call a fully grouted board. And what do we do by this fully grouted board? We change, uh, say, the ground conditions surrounding the tunnel. So that means we are changing uh, our ground reaction curve, which is formally this one, but then we bring in some boards and this brings some cohesion to the, uh, so say, uh, fracture zone or plastic zone. And by having this uh, very dense uh, bolted uh, situation around the uh, tunnel, we can shift our ground reaction curve downwards so that we get a new ground reaction curve caused by the boards, which are fully grouted. And uh, also this was, uh, a bit seen by Charlie, we have some uh, stresses, some some tension, some compression along the board. We measured that uh, in in the tunnel of Langen uh, the first time in 1998, first time to figure out what is the real load on a board. So uh, what I what I wanted to to figure out is that if you use these uh, they say fully grouted boards, which is normal case in uh, soft ground uh, tunneling or soft rock uh, tunneling, then it's not the case that you can use this Fenner Pacher and, and bring it um, in like a short bit or an arch or whatever. No, you are changing the ground reaction curve and uh, that's uh, the most important point what I wanted to figure out with this curve. Then it's uh, f uh, clear that if we do a soft rock uh, tunnel, we have some pre-deformations which can be figured out uh, by extensometers. Uh, if, if it's a shallow tunnel, you can do that from the surface. Anyhow, we know that we have some deformations uh, ahead of the face, of course, and not all of these deformations can really be measured because the zero measurement is done later because you cannot go in when uh, the muck is, is brought out. This pre-deformation can majorly be influenced uh, by uh, the boards. And as we are talking about uh, soft ground uh, or soft uh, rock uh, engineering, um, we use normally injection boards uh, for getting a stress into this direction so that our pre-deformation is not too high. Uh, completely different is, it, is the situation if we have, uh, let's say, um, a, a rock which has fissures, then we normally use swell exports uh, because here the main topic of the board is to get it fixed uh, very, very quickly uh, and not so much to, uh, to reduce the deformation, uh, say, ahead of the face. The face support um, is normally done uh, directly in the face. So that means that we cut off the so-called injection boards every round length. And the stability of the working face is, is now uh, significantly improved because we are bringing in these boards into uh, the working, directly into the working face. 
plus bringing in some kind of boards which we call uh, four polling elements but the elements are the same than the boards what we use it's a pre-support it's a four polling element in the roof of the tunnel uh, that's how we would like to get rid of or let's say reduce these deformations in, in front of the face. Now, uh, one a big job is the avoidance of a dome-like uh, failure uh, by bolting and forepoling. So what we saw already in one uh, slide before is that uh, this is a typical problem in, in soft uh, rock tunneling. Uh, if we are, let's say, in a deep tunnel, we normally get this dome-like uh, failure. Uh, procedure and our job now is to avoid that this dome is really uh, then uh, say uh, coming into and for this we make a split into four polling elements again the four polling elements um, evil boards whatever um, are the same elements than the boards which we are using here from 10 to 2 uh, so here we use these um, boards uh, as a kind of foundation uh, so that we can avoid that this dome moves into and uh, at the same time we use these four polling elements the same elements as i said um, to stabilize uh, the ground ahead of the face so this uh, is looking like that all support measures installed into the ground prior to the excavation uh, to to improve ground conditions ahead we have the face towels which are cut back every round length uh, and they have to be uh, shortened every round length, of course. Uh, typical drawing, what we do here, we, uh, we tell the construction company, bring in your spile, your four polling, your EBO element uh, before you open, and then you open and bring in up uh, your, your uh, thin layer of shot grid immediately. In a photo, it looks like this. Uh, you see a quite dense, um, um, let's say, installation of these four polling elements. Uh, in this case, uh, the, we, we are using uh, EVO boards. Uh, in the roof area from uh, 10 o'clock to 2 o'clock, so to say, from the geometric uh, point of view. And then left-hand side and right-hand side, we use the boards in the 90 degrees other direction uh, to build up a kind of foundation uh, for, um, for this soft ground. Uh, in the face itself, uh, you see that we are using uh, EBO boards together with some distribution tracks. Uh, the point is, um, the, sh the shock grid could not withstand the high load which is coming from the face. That's why we, we are using these uh, uh, injection boards plus these uh, distribution tracks at the face so that we can uh, keep stability uh, with these boards. In the lab, it looks like this. We have a, a, a typical uh, failure mode here. Uh, a so-called chimney uh, occurs. Uh, as you see, uh, the chimney would come into uh, if we have the face here. That's why we install the uh, spiles quite early. Uh, in some cases, it was not enough. So, so the installment of these um, uh, spiles was not enough. And um, yeah, what occurred? is we had an overbreak because the, the four polling elements, uh, what kind uh, ever we use for this um, uh, four polling, is it, if it is uh, EVO boards, then uh, yeah, it was not enough in this case. And I wanted to show you a typical uh, failure which we had the last uh, year, uh, where the face elements were not enough. I just showed you a short film. You see that... Uh, Material is flowing in, uh, the bolts were already uh, broken. Uh, the four polling elements here, all these uh, bolts which were used as four polling ends were not enough. The question was, uh, okay, does it stabilize uh, by running out by the friction angle? The problem was that uh, quite big uh, mass of water uh, was still there. So you will uh, see in a second uh, the mass which is now coming from from such failure modes. We we can learn a lot uh, for the next time how to dimension the four polling elements. And uh, in this case, of course, uh, the bolts uh, what we have on the market are for sure not enough. You see now the mass is coming, uh, and now 
you see the mass is now running in and now the water is coming. So just to, to give you an indication of uh, how big these loads uh, could be. Uh, and of course, uh, if somebody would have known that, we would have uh, made a complete other, let's say, dimensioning of the four polling elements, but also of the uh, bolts at the side. Another example, um, uh, soft rock tunneling. You see here um, um, a tunnel which has to be uh, driven three times to up to that point that we have the final profile. You see, we did the tunnel uh, here, uh, quite small. It had a deformation of more than one meter. Then it was again, uh, let's say, built, uh, but the uh, bolts were completely damaged. And then after having again one meter of deformation, another a third time the tunnel was built and another about uh, one meter was coming in. And of course, no, no bolt uh, on the market available uh, for such uh, situations. You see here typical deformations which we get. Uh, the steel is deformed like butter. And what you see is the bolt after some, uh, uh, let's say, centimeters already gets uh, cracked. The plates are the completely deformed. Uh, the plates are uh, broken. And then we, we have to, let's say, re-excavate uh, the tunnel uh, one more time. This brings us to uh, solutions uh, like you see here with very long four polling elements with very long uh, bolts and with yielding elements uh, in between, but not only in the arch uh, uh, on the top heading, but also in the temporary inward we are using, uh, say, um, yielding uh, elements. Different types of yielding elements are used. Uh, we can use these uh, pipes, so we can use um some some bolts as you see here what what we do by such high deformations is we bring some deformations element also under the plates of uh, all the bolts a typical picture of such a situation uh, you can see here very very dense bolting plus the yielding elements in between what i showed on the plan and all these um uh, boltings all these plates here uh, have some rolls, some cylinders under the blade so that they get a little bit uh, more capacity for the deformation. There is a development or there was a development by, I think um, it was Atlas Copco at the time, which developed a, a, a quite a good uh, bolt for high deformable uh, rocks, which was called Rufex. Uh, was not really used in the tunneling uh, industry because much too expensive, uh, but the idea was good, uh, but it works only for deformations up to at that time when I was uh, getting this boat in hands, it was uh, able to take about uh, 30 centimeters of deformation, but we have more than two meters of radial deformation, so there was no port available for this uh, situation. Uh, this board is working in, in such a way, it is end fixed uh, on this point here. Then it has a certain length which you can deform, uh, about uh, in this case 30 centimeters. Then it uh, gets a peak load and after that it fails. Now if we, if we are talking about what are the effects of bolting, of course, of course one uh, effect is uh, hanging, the hanging effect, so we can nail back, so to say, these uh, blocks which are falling down, we can nail back or uh, hold up uh, with these uh, bolts uh, yeah, uh, on the elastic zone. We can uh, bolt uh, the side walls. We can, in a typical slope, um, using these end fixed uh, bolts, also uh, we, uh, keep the, the uh, slope stable by very long, uh, say cable boards. Uh, the cable boards in our uh, countryside have a length of about 60 meters. So typically they are end fixed and then we have, uh, let's say, a slope, slope height of 40 to 50 meters. Then we need these long uh, cable boards for these uh, effects. Uh, the other effect is um, majorly a timber uh, forming effect. Uh, we can have that in the uh, roof area. We can have that in the uh, bottom area and uh, then another effect would be the arching effect uh, where we already tried to do that numerically what is uh, well, let's say what kind of force is going 
into the arch uh, or into the into the board on which position it is very clear by these deformations which we get we have normal forces but also shear forces uh, on the board uh, which the boards have to withstand Robert, uh, two, we, minutes, two minutes please yeah uh, we have very special solutions in some fold zones this is an example of bolo tunnel in turkey uh, where this polo tunnel was, uh, let's say, going through the fort zone. You see that we, we used very, very long boards for this, but also a quite big amount of uh, concrete. Here you see minus 4.5 meters of concrete, but with uh, a combination of very, very long boards. As in the fort zone, this top heading was not uh, being able to be stabilized. We used, uh, let's say, uh, boards in the um leg area of this uh, top heading to hang this uh, top heading into the uh, uh, into the fold zone yeah there are many say uh, reasons why we do bolting i don't want to run through that from foreboarding to action works and um for this we have typically these self drilling uh, boards uh, the self drilling uh, hollow bar boards which have a uh, let's say a tool which is then lost uh, where you can bring in the injection through this board uh, you can also put the resin uh, grouted board in or you use these self drilling uh, uh, self drilling friction boards uh, typically having a layout like this um, and this is what uh, such a board is consisting of normally uh, we we are using a nut and then uh, a plate and then a hollow bar a coupling so that you can uh, do the bolt as long as you want but our recommendation is don't do the bolt longer longer than 12 meters because uh, it's so flexible so that you lose your direction where you want it uh, the bolt in uh, besides the zebo we are also having ebs uh, which means that we can uh, bring the injection in a certain uh, length uh, in a very high quality so that we can bring up much more load to this yeah, and with this, I'm coming to my uh, last slide. Um, and uh, with this last slide, I'm ending to say what Professor Leopold Müller uh, said. We should, um, let's say, uh, bring in our support elements following a bit the intuition, uh, what we have, and not only following calculation results. With this, I would like to close my lecture. Thanks for listening, and I'm waiting for your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robert, for this uh, very interesting and very useful presentation, uh, focusing on soft rock. But uh, I would say, even in hard rock environments, we need to know about uh, soft rock behavior when we cross fractured zone or fold zone. <laughs> so it's yep. always it's always useful. Uh, the video you have presented was impressive regarding the the behavior of the of the collapsing rock mass. That was mm -hmm. very, very interesting. Very interesting. Thank you. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much, both of you. That was good. Um, now we can start uh, really the, the debate itself. And I will launch the debate by asking the first question, sort of a silly question. Uh, what about face plates? Are they still useful or not? Yeah, if, if you ask the question to myself, uh, I would say yes. Uh, the face plates, if, if I'm talking about soft rock tunneling and especially uh, making the face support, yeah. I need the face plates because the mass is, let's say, coming uh, against the tunnel uh, driving direction. And even though the plate often is not enough, and I tried to, to, to show you a photo with this, even putting tracks on it so that we have a low distribution, otherwise um, the, the shot fit would fail and uh, all the rock mass is coming in. And this is uh, kind of what happened in my film, what I showed you, that the rock mass was disturbing uh, the whole shot fit, uh, plus, uh, let's say, damaging also the face boards. Yes, face plates uh, in this case, I would say, are useful, but not in all the ones. Maybe Charlie wants to comment. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Face absolute uh, face plate for me that's uh, very important. You have to have a face plate. Without the face plate, and then you have a very long debounded section. 
uh, I saw uh, the bolt just sinking into the rock mass after failure of the plate. So uh, Robert showed us a photo of this failed plate after failure and the bolt just sink, sank into the rock mass. Uh, absolutely, bolt, uh, the uh, face, uh, plate, uh, bolt uh, plate is important. Okay, thank you. So now the, the questions can be asked by the, the audience. Uh, so you can directly uh, ask your question. Please, you present yourself uh, first and then you ask your question. Sorry, you have to raise your hand before because I you, if you want to switch off your microphone. Yeah. No, it's okay. Yeah, I think you can do it by yourself. Good. Perfect, yeah. So we're Sorry. waiting for the, for the questions. Please, Malik. Hello, uh, hi, I'm Ekas Malik. I am from uh, Larson and Tubro, India. So I, I, it was an excellent presentation by Dr. Galler and Dr. Lee. So I had certain uh, queries about rock bolts and some more understanding I would love to have on that. So uh, uh, there are two specific things. One is on the uh, like behavior of rock bolts under different stress conditions, which uh, Dr. Lee has uh, had presented. And other is on the testing part on verification uh, of that. So the first one is uh, like, as Dr. Lee said, that the bolts have behaved differently and he has done an excellent work. I've read his work on rock bolting under different stress conditions, that low in situ stress, uh, the load is the governing factor and uh, under high stress is the yielding part. Like now we have started to have more of permanent bolts also in the tunneling. Um, so the factor of safety, which we define for the bolts in the tunnel applications. So usually it is defined in terms of loads. So in some of my previous experience also in one of our project also, it was defined like that. And uh, so uh, how far correct is that? Like, because uh, in uh, other cases of high in-situ stress cases, the yielding, uh, the deformation part or the strain part is playing a major role. So is there something we can, uh, or we should be looking forward to uh, defining the factor of safety along with in terms of strains? Yeah, this is the first, uh, I think, my... I would like to understand more on that. I think that question is directed to me. Um, yeah, um, yeah. Yes. Um, yes. The load, the, the bolt load, is very difficult to estimate. Uh, so I have talked about the loading condition. That's just to help us to understand the, the real situation. In, in the real, you know, uh, the practice, the only thing is that only you have to observe. The rock. If you have seen your bolt, your your bolt failed, uh, or your plate is heavily loaded, that means the load is very high, right? So you know the strength of your your bolt. Um, the the safety factor for the low stress, I think that's that's uh, relatively easier. Uh, you have to do have uh, es estimate your the the the, uh, the potentially unstable block size, how how large it is. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. And then you can you can estimate the the, the load uh, in the squeezing squeezing uh, situation. That's very important. Uh, that's very difficult. I, I have to say, uh, yeah, based on the, the deformation, how much the deformation it is, you can you can estimate. But not only that, it's all it depend also depends on the boat length. If your boat length is very short, and then the whole boat will follow. Together we you know we follow the rock together they just move together. Actually, the boat does not uh, is not loaded, so you mm -hmm. only you, you have to have a very long uh, boat uh, boat length and the, the the end of the boat is in a relatively stable rock and then you get some load in the in the bulk. Um, you uh, I seen I think you have to uh, verify that based on your field observation. If you have seen your boat is very heavily loaded and then you see. And then you can estimate. Uh, theory does not tell you, uh, really. <laughs> I can <laughs> tell you. <laughs> yeah, Robert, maybe <laughs> supplement. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Jali. Uh, may I add something, uh, especially for the soft rock uh, tunneling? 
uh, we recommend that we do uh, during the design step already tests for the pull out so we try to pull out what is the load with which i would pull out this bolt in a comparable geology normally if you if you work in a design uh, consultant uh, office they have enough experience already but if you are let's say working the first time in this special ground please do your pull out tests and then put a safety factor to that yes fine um, it, 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 there is sometimes a misunderstanding. If I if I deliver, say, a 250 kilonewton bolt to the construction site, it does not mean that this uh, bolt can uh, really withstand 250 kilonewton because in the clay formation, you know, you pour out this uh, this uh, bolt maybe having already 100 uh, only 100 uh, kilonewton. Mm -hmm. So the pour out test is the uh, is the say main point in the design then put the safety factor to that uh, maybe this is uh, um, depending on the countryside where you are and uh, then you make it the mentioning of the boards i'm speaking of the face support boards and say uh, such a dimensioning can also be done for the roof uh, board um, yeah this is what i wanted to add to charlie's uh, recommendation uh, philip <laughs> may i uh, add some uh, comment on uh, yeah. Rob robert's comment yes, <laughs> it's yes, about please. the pull out the pullout. Um, I really have some suspicion on pullout. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, the, when you do the pullout, you, when, if your bolt length is very long, uh, the reloaded section when you do the pullout, it's very short. Uh, in weak rock, could be uh, up to one meter, but in hard rock, it's only half meter. Mm. Uh, the, the, the half meter, that means uh, you cannot pull out the, the bolt quite often. Uh, in hard rock, in weak rock, uh, maybe uh, if your bolt is very short, but the longer than three meters bolt, it's very hard to pull it out. Mm -hmm. No, no, I'm speaking about the uh, ground uh, uh, soft rock conditions uh, for the face bolting, and this is uh, how at least we do it. Uh, uh, we, what we, is uh, the bolt length? What is the bolt length for face? Yeah, in, in in case say three to four meters. Oh, but in, in you see in in clay formations you you it could happen that you really pull it out, mm. uh, and and this is uh, what you must know. What is the force uh, which can be taken by this kind of bolt? Okay. I hope this helps Malik a bit. Okay. Yeah. Just uh, just on this same I think on testing pull out, uh, two things come to my mind. Like one is as the length of this bolt is increasing beyond certain limit. I think there have been some testing also on that. Uh, maybe around uh, uh, 1.2 meters, 2 meters, more than that. So the frictional component is increasing more. So whether uh, what we are getting exactly is the, really the load carrying capacity of that uh, bar. And second thing is, uh, I, there's a little contradiction. I mean, how I understand is when we are doing the pullout test, we are applying load in the opposite direction. Like we are applying load on the steel bar and then further it is transferred to the grout and then to the... Uh, rock mass, but in actual scenario, the load transfer is in the opposite direction. It is coming from the rock mass to the grout interface and then to the steel bars. So, is there uh, something yeah. maybe with the no, development no. Uh, on the testing? No, no. Uh, but you you have to imagine you have um, a mass which wants to come out of the face, and you have to uh, fix your board backwards, uh, so like in a slope so that your your bolt is long enough in the elastic so to say area or in the area which has to uh, which has stabilized been. so yeah, it's right. a more or less the same uh, situation than a pull out test <laughs> okay yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay thank you thank you another question from the audience well before the next one comes may i Question, uh, Robert. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> <Let's see>. Robert, <laughs> uh, very interesting yeah. about this uh, application of a grouted bolt in uh, in weak rock internally. Uh, I just tell you just some some experience from mines. Uh, in mines, they uh, uh, were squeezing. That's usually the stress, very high stress. Not re only the uh, gr the ground is very weak it's because of the high stress, and then the the rock fails. And becomes very weak rock because it's in the frack zone. Mm -hmm. um, and then in that case, they do not uh, believe, uh, not only believe that they have troubles with the grouted bolts. 
you have shown us this uh, the face plate uh, failed, right? So in such high stress, weak rock mass, and then this full grout both failed on the on the face plate or mm -hmm. the 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 thread. Uh, mm -hmm. And then you know all over on the on the floor, you can see this plate uh, plate just fell. Mm -hmm. They use what well, their solution is use this uh, frictional bolt, not mm -hmm. uh, Swellex, too expensive. They mm -hmm. use uh, split set. Mm -hmm. uh, split set. They use you know if you look you go to Australia, you can see oh, this. Uh, I think more than half of the bolts that are split set. For yeah. me, that's very weak rock. It's uh, you know they install there and then this face play this split is just moving together with the rock mass and uh, mm -hmm. still stand there. Uh, that's their solution. Uh, in a, it, it seems you have uh, you, you have experience good with the grouted uh, yes in the weak in squeezing rock. Yeah, right. in uh, I would I would say of course we have to bring in more boards after I showed you the re-excavation as the deformations are so high. What we try is to do with the grouted boards is we try to raise up cohesion and friction angle, so to say we we help the fractured zone to get better uh, quality. The reason why we don't split uh, we we don't use split set is uh, first the split set is not available in that length what we uh, expect our say uh, fractured zone and we would like to reach through the whole fractured zone so our boards uh, are in most cases between four and eight meters long and uh, on the other side uh, the split set um, to my knowledge cannot take such a high load so the split set takes mm. about 100 kilonewton in this range we are, let's say, working with boards such a diameter, which uh, from the steel capacity uh, starts at 250 uh, kilonewton. This is uh, what I know not available from the split set. I know that the mining is using it uh, quite a lot, but in tunneling, uh, we are very much used to Swellex uh, if we are using friction boards uh, and or then the injection boards. This is the mm. most you, used. You mentioned the Swellex. Yeah, you mentioned Svelex. Yeah. Do you only use Svelex or you add more bolts, grouted bolts afterwards? Uh, the Svelex is used directly behind the face. So if, uh, so to say, we have a dangerous situation that by the next round length, a block could come down, then we immediately install the Svelex because this is uh, working uh, from one second to the next one, where the grouted boards, or let's say the ESN, and say it takes uh, 30 minutes until it gets hardened because in tunneling, yes, yes. at least in our region, we do not use any resin cartridges. So no, we are no, using no. cementous uh, mortar, and this takes more time to to, key, to, to get the, the force uh, taken yeah. than the swelling. So the swelling. Yeah. So My concern is a crucial so. problem. If uh, that's a not a long, you know, permanent uh, support uh, element, uh, Svelex, mm -hmm. it's uh, a crucial, you know, mm -hmm. crucial, it's a long time. Uh, that could be a problem, right? Uh, yeah, but uh, completely right. But you are talking maybe already about the single line tunnel. Uh, we're in, in Austria for the moment, we are building double line tunnels. So uh, this, uh, it doesn't matter if it's, it's corrodes, say, because we are coming with the inner lining. And uh, as soon as the inner lining is in, we don't need uh, the capacity of the Swellex anymore. That so, means that you are bolting just a temporary support for temporary yes. support, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. So, okay. Mm. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, interesting. Uh, Robert, basically you use Swellex uh, to save time, to have an effective uh, support as quick, as short as possible. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a question for both of you on that. Uh, I think Charlie said the word expensive. Uh, what is the amount uh, in a tunnel, roughly, of course, what is the amount that is taken by, by rock bolting during the excavation process? I could show you a slide, but I would have to search for it. Yeah, if you have one round, is said 100%, then the bolting procedure in tunneling in our country takes about 10%. 10%? 10% of the time, yes. Yeah, 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 the, of the time. Okay. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. We have a question in the, in the room, Philippe. Okay. 
Pleza Ditya Singh. I don't know how you pronounce your name. I'm sorry. Uh, am I audible? Yes, go yeah. ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm Aditya Singh. I am uh, from uh, IIT Rupi, Indian Institute of Technology Rupi. Uh, my question is to Robert that uh, you talk about grouted, uh, uh, grouted bolts and uh, it improves the rock mass property C and phi. So how to assess that improvement? I want to ask that. What yeah. is the magnitude you are yeah, uh, we can, we, we, we tried already to figure out what is the improvement of the ground around. The, improve, the improvement is not very high for this Balkan. Um, you can count on about uh, 80 kilonewton because we, we have a cohesion increase. And this cohesion increase, uh, what we say per board is between 40 and 80 kilonewton per square meter. So kilopascal. So this is not a big amount, of course. Uh, but uh, if you count on all the boards which you bring in, it brings some some uh, cohesion increase. So uh, what we do then in the numerics uh, is we instead of uh, let's say um, uh, uh, doing a discrete modeling of all the boards, we say okay around the tunnel we do a cohesion increase of the material in that amount, uh, say uh, about between 40 and 80 kilopascal per board. <laughs> Another question? Uh, so I just need to ask one thing. Yep. Am, I, am I audible? I'm at this thing again. So uh, the assessment is through the numerical modeling. The yes. Improvement in, uh, so it is uh, implicitly assumed that whatever is happening is just because of the increase in the cohesion. It is not uh, because of the stiffness improvement, something of that kind. Because when you are grouting it, maybe the elastic property of the ground is also changing. Because in the pilot element, if I'm going for modeling, there are a lot of parameters which are being used. If I'm going for monopolar modeling, E, mu, then C, phi, then dilation angle into account. So deformations are dependent upon a lot of parameters. So, yeah. uh... so how to fix it to the cohesion only? I mean, um, uh, the point is you, you are mentioning the other parameters. Uh, truly spoken, as Charlie said already, uh, the theory is, uh, let's say, a little bit behind the practical experience. And what we see is, I mean, a, de a dilation, for example, a dilation angle, you can hardly measure. You could measure in, in a shear test, if you have a really good machine, uh, what is your uh, dilatation, so to say, uh, change. Um, I can only say, if we would like to consider the boards, keep the friction angle where it is, maybe you put one or two degrees to that uh, existing value, and put some extra cohesion because of the grouting material. That's what I can tell you. The other parameters, Young's modulus, uh, they say Poisson's ratio, whatever you have, um, we do not uh, change uh, because of that. Mm -hmm. in, in theory, there are a lot of parameters uh, which are influenced by bolting, but um, we, we, we do not have, let's say, research results enough so that we can really say, okay, the dilatation is changing this way, the Young's modulus is changing this way, so we are lacking of uh, knowledge on that, I would say. <laughs> Another question? Uh, can, can I have a question to uh, Robert again? So uh, I'm curious this tunneling, uh, you you uh, in Australia. Well, so yes, you, please. Yeah, you use a uh, lot of grouting. Uh, is it uh, dominate the cement grout or polyester? Racing grout, no. No, it's dominated by cement uh, grouting material. Uh, because you have to imagine, uh, we do say in, in, in soft uh, uh, rock conditions, we do about three times around length a day. 
So three times uh, round length we are working 24 hours means we have eight hours per round length. So we say there is no need to, to put in uh, very expensive routing materials which harden the e extremely fast because all the other procedures bringing up the wire mesh, uh, bringing up the first layer of short grid, installing the arch, all the things, they take some time. And during this time, the cementous routing material can already uh, get hardened. Of course, we are also using some uh, some cameras here at my Zentrum am Berg, which you see um, uh, behind. We are doing tests with different routing materials, also to show the students or the colleagues who would like to see it, how different uh, routing materials are really working uh, in the face area. Point is, you shouldn't forget that we have a waste law. And the waste law is quite strict. And if we have too, man too many chemicals in our excavated material, because afterwards we have to excavate this uh, material where we have the face boards in, yeah. we are um, having the dangerous situation that we are coming into a more expensive excavation class or say the landfill class because we have too many chemicals in and we have to have a look also on this yeah mm -hmm. okay understood mm -hmm. uh, environment uh, requirement it's another matter it, yes yeah. environment mm -hmm. nowadays yeah, is an important uh, important uh, point okay good thank you i have a question for both of you uh tell me about your your experience regarding rock bolting when you have water inflow in a tunnel or in mine. Well, what uh, when we have water, that's the first that's uh, increased the difficulty for installation. Uh, so, <laughs> so for special for grouting, right? For grouting, uh, you have to. That's why sometimes you have you're forced to use the chemical. Yeah. Grouting, uh, and then the chemical uh, grouting also historically it caused some environmental problem, mm -hmm. but now today's product products are better. Uh, you, you have to increase the confidence of the users, and uh, it is a problem. Water always cause problem. Uh, it's a installation problem, crucial problem, uh, afterward, uh, and also pressure, right? So. Uh, uh, well, as long as the rock bolt is installed and then, then the bolt will work there. Uh, that's mainly the, I think that's the installation will negatively uh, impact. So Robert, maybe you have other experience. I mean, uh, here the question goes back to uh, Felipe. Uh, the question is how much water do we get? I mean, in, in, <laughs> in, in, in yes. Semmering, for example, we now have a 300 liter per second, 300 yeah. liter. So uh, this means uh, there is absolutely nothing to be done then to get rid of the water first. So yeah. we do 50 meter long injections. Yeah. Uh, I would say in the face uh, about uh, 20 injections, 50 meter long to reduce the water first. <laughs> and then uh, we start uh, with the normal, uh, under brackets, the normal procedure uh, to get uh, boards in and, and arches in and, and, and so on. Mm -hmm. so, as, as Charlie says, uh, water always means uh, difficulties, but it depends very much on the amount. Yes. And do you test the efficiency of rock bolting in these conditions just to, to assess uh, if it works or not, or if there is a certain uh, decrease in terms of uh, efficiency? Um, truly spoken, this is um, not on a no, no, not on a theoretical basis. Uh, we are testing different uh, grouting materials under such conditions when it really occurs. And yeah. here, of course, uh, chemicals come into the game, uh, yeah. which were mentioned by by Charlie, because we have to get rid of the water first. Um, I cannot tell you uh, how much of the efficiency it costs. Because uh, first of all, we, we have to know which kind of grouting material is working, which is not washed out. Because all these cementous based uh, grouting materials are then washed out, then forget it. We, we have mm -hmm. to then switch to the really the chemicals. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, on the one hand, a matter of time, of course, but on the other hand, very much a matter of cost and mm -hmm. uh, a matter of environmental improvement so that we are allowed to do it. 
Yes, in that case, uh, expandable balls are usable. Are, yeah. uh, are useful, right? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So, like Svelix yes, and sure. other type of expandable mm -hmm. balls. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have a question from the audience now? I see no hands. Okay, so if we don't, we're going to close this. Uh, this session. Uh, thank you again, Robert. Thank you again, Charlie, for your very interesting presentation. Uh, just a few words about the next debate that is almost already organized. Uh, I'll try to focus on the failure criteria and we will start uh, debating on the more Coulomb and Hook Brown uh, failure criteria. I think it will be also very interesting and very useful for practitioners. Well, Muriel. Yes, just, just one more word, just to remember everyone, because we had uh, some times problem, you know, because of uh, uh, hours and so on. So just to remember everyone that the debate was uh, uh, recorded and you can, f if you arrive too late to um, follow the presentation, you will be able to have them on uh, YouTube, on uh, the RSMRM, Sorry, on the ISRM YouTube channel. So feel free to feel free to go there and to uh, re the follow the debate again. Okay. Thanks for your invitation, Philippe. It was a pleasure to do it with you, Charlie. Thanks, thank you. for listening. Thank you, Philippe, uh, Morel, or uh, Robert. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you for all uh, yeah. participants. Thanks for the antonyms, yeah. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.